have been discussing Christian spirituality, and this is our fourth week. And when we hear the word spirituality, everyone thinks something different. So we've had an opportunity to talk about how in the world when someone hears spirituality, they think about getting in touch with their inner self or getting in touch with what is truly them rather than their thoughts which may or may not be true about who they are. And then we've been going to the scriptures for a definition of Christian spirituality and to see what Christian spirituality looks like. So last week, um, we were looking at one key aspect that flows from Christian spirituality. Does anybody remember what that was? What, what did we study? What concept last week? Peace. Okay. And we talked about how peace comes through Jesus Christ, and we talked about the different ways that peace comes. Tonight, we're going to look at joy. And last week, we talked about how we can have peace when circumstances are outside of our control. And tonight, we're going to see from the scriptures how we can have joy in the midst of hardship. So it's one thing to say everything's out of control. Everything might be out of control, but it's really not so bad. Do, do, do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes in your life, it might seem like everything's out of control because you don't know what will happen in the future. But it's not necessarily bad. But tonight, we're looking at something that's even saying, wow, this is even more intense. Because it's saying, I can have joy in the midst of hardship and bad times and when things aren't going very well. But I want to begin with a question. What's the difference between peace and joy? If somebody comes up to you and says, what's the difference, peace and joy? Aren't they like the same thing, two sides of the same coin? How would you respond? Who would like to share? How would you respond? Yes. Exactly, exactly. So peace is more like a calm acceptance. But that's different from joy. Joy is like, I'm tickled pink, you know, okay? So the Bible doesn't simply say that we can have peace in any circumstance. It says we can have joy and hardship. Do you see how that's, that's elevated? That's a higher concept than what we looked at last week. <clears throat> One of the things I like doing is reading Christian biographies about the lives of great Christians. And one of my favorite biographies is about a Christian preacher from Great Britain whose name was Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he was a, a preacher in the, in the 20th century. He, di he died in the 1980s, and he had a big impact on Christianity around the world through his pulpit in, in London. And <clears throat> he preached verse by verse through the book of Romans for more than seven years um, in his Friday night Bible, Bible lecture series. So he, he gets to this verse um, in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. And I want you to read the verse, and then I want to tell you what, what happened with Dr. Lloyd-Jones. So who would like to read Romans 14, 17 for us? Romans fourteen seventeen. For the kingdom of God is now power and keeping and preaching, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. In other words, Christianity isn't oh don't don't eat this, don't don't drink this. That's what Paul's saying. And people um, were having arguments over whether or not you could eat meat or not eat meat, that kind of thing. So Paul says, what is the kingdom of God? It's not what you eat and not what you drink. Instead, what's the first thing? Righteousness. righteousness. What does that mean? The kingdom of God is righteousness. Being right with God. Being, yes, being, being one. It's not 
our actions per se. Yeah. It's, it's the fact that we have been made right in the sight of God. So the kingdom of God begins with the righteousness of Christ, which is given to us when we believe. So Paul says, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's righteousness. What else is it? Peace. Peace with God. Peace in the midst of all kinds of circumstances that are outside of our control. And we looked at that in depth last week. But what else is the kingdom of God? Joy. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Well, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached all through Romans, and he did a sermon on the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness. And then the next week he did a sermon. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace, okay? And then he gets to the next week. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace. And he got cancer, and he wasn't able to preach the message, and that's where the Roman series stopped. And when someone said, why do you think God stopped you? He said, I feel unworthy to preach on that text, that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because it is the highest expression of what Christianity is. And Dr. Lloyd-Jones, who was known for being one of the most peaceful persons that anyone had ever spent any time with. People said that when they hung out with Martin Lloyd-Jones that they had this great sense of abiding peace. He was never flustered. You know how you get flustered? Oh, I've got so many things to do today! Ah! Traffic! Ah! The shortcut between here and, and uh, Echo Beach! Ah! You, you know, and that, that's not peace, but that's how we get well, Lloyd-Jones was never like that. And everybody said that. Lloyd-Jones was, was never like that. And even this great man who was known for his peace felt like he was unworthy to preach on the joy. And what happened is, is as his cancer progressed, he lost his voice and his uh, ability to talk. So he would sit in his hospital room like this and people would come visit him. Him. And one of his friends came and said to him, Oh, it just so bothers me to see you sitting here, weary, worn, and sad. Because he wasn't talking. And he goes... And the guy gave him a pen. And he wrote, Not sad. Not sad. He was just days away from glory. And he had begun to taste what it was like to experience the joy of the Lord and knowing for sure where he was going. So he, he made it a point... And one of the last things he ever wrote to anyone, communicated to anyone, were the words, not sad. So the point is, is that we're dealing with a subject, we're on holy ground when we deal with this subject of, of joy in the Lord in the midst of hardship. We are dealing with the epitome of Christianity. And this is different from Buddhism. You know what the goal of Buddhism is? It's not joy. I've never met a single Buddhist who says that the, that the goal of Buddhism is joy. But I have met dozens of Buddhists, Buddhists who tell me that the goal of Buddhism is what? Peace. Peace. Or, the Dalai Lama says in his book, the art of happiness. Yeah. Happiness and peace. Oh. But I've never once heard a Buddhist say to me, joy. Because joy is a uniquely Christian concept. And it is different, and it is amazing, and it is the essence of spirituality, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Let me ask you a question. Uh, I read the Dalai Lama's book, The Art of Happiness. I loved it. I thought it was fabulous, it. Yeah. fabulous book. I love that book. I've given that book to friends, and that makes my, some of my Christian friends irritated at me. Oh, you're giving a Buddhist book to someone? I'm like, it's a great book. Read it. You know, it, you might get happier than you are. But what's the difference between happiness and joy? Well, that's the question. <clears throat> what do you think? What's the difference between happiness and joy? If your friend comes to you and says, what's the difference? Happiness and joy. I don't know. What are you going to say? Happiness, like, more from outside. For example, when we did something or we get something, then we get Absolutely. happiness. But joy is from inside. So Absolutely. Right. Happiness is completely contingent upon your circumstances. I get a new 
Samsung Note 10, and I am happy, you know? Then I lose it, and I am sad. Well, happiness can come and go. It really bothers me when, when I talk to parents of teenagers and I say, well, you know, what do you want for your child? And they say, I want my child to be happy. I'm thinking, you stupid idiot. That, that's, that's like, first of all, it's unrealistic because life is full of things that make you unhappy. And, and often what it is that makes people happy is not what makes them holy at first. What, what makes them happy is getting drunk on the weekends, going out, banging your girlfriend in the back seat of a car. That's what makes them happy. You know, I got a girlfriend. Yes. You know, but that's not what the scripture teaches. So the point is, is that we're dealing with a subject of joy, which has nothing to do with our circumstances. And that's what we're going to look at now. Let's look at several verses. We're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul, um, beginning in um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. That's Philippians 2, 17 and 18. <clears throat> Who would like to read that for us? Philippians. Philippians 2. 17. My Bible's on the fritz. Somebody want to read this? 17 and 18. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering a food sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Okay, who's writing this? Paul. The Apostle Paul who wrote 11 books of the New Testament. The, the greatest apostle that ever lived, evangelized more people, started more churches... Okay. Now, where is Paul when he writes this? Where is Paul? In the jail. What? In the jail. He's in the jail. Okay. And what does he say in verses 17 and 18? What's going on in his heart? Is he happy? He's joking. No, he's not happy to be in, in prison, to be sharing his cell with rats that are stealing his food. But he does say something else. What does he say? Right. I am suffering. My life is being poured out as an offering for the sake of your faith. Because what I've experienced has happened because I've done everything in my life so that you might believe. Because of that, what do I do? He says in verse 17. I rejoice. And what else? I share my joy. Do you want to know what the most remarkable verse in the Bible is? It deals with um, it, it, it deals with a similar instance. Look at um, look at Ephesians chapter three. And my Bible has to stop being on the fritz because I need to look at this first. Yeah. Ephesians chapter three. Hang on, I'll tell you what what. Um, We don't hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, it's verse 13. What does he say to the Ephesian Christians? Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. Now, Paul's worried about the Ephesians, and he's worried that, that they'll do something in verse 13. What is that? Lose heart. To lose heart. They'll be like so upset. For what reason? What would they be upset about? They would be upset over his tribulations. This is unbelievable. This is not the Ephesians writing Paul saying, Paul, hang in there. I know it's hard. I know you're suffering, but just know we love you. We're praying for you. No, this is the one who's suffering so much for the sake of them. And he says, I ask you, don't lose heart at my tribulations on your on your behalf because they are your glory. So my, my point is, is that 
Christianity is this unbelievably amazing religion that grants people the ability to have joy in hardship, joy in tribulation. In fact, that is the distinctiveness of what Christianity should bring about in our lives. So let me ask each one of you, do you have joy in hardship? Do you have joy in tri tribulation? Yes or no? If you say yes, raise your hand. Do you have joy? I'm, I'm getting there. You're getting Okay. So you can raise your hand halfway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, when you get it, like... What happens if you don't have joy? What does it look like? What are the characteristics of not having the joy? There are two main characteristics of not having joy. What are they? You're depressed. You're sad. You're sad. Never thought about it that way. Um, but, oh, the, the, okay, ah, sorry, that, sorry. that's an internal feeling that I'm saying with regards to actions. What would be two actions? that would show that someone doesn't have joy. Has to do with their speech. Um, right. They either complain or they curse because they're angry. Yeah. They complain or they curse. So let me ask, do you complain? Do I complain? Do you curse? Sorry. Do you curse? Because if you complain or if you curse, then you don't have the joy of the Lord in your heart. Sorry. You, you got the flesh, you know, you're, you're not walking according to the Holy Spirit, you're walking in the flesh. So do you see how Christian spirituality raises our common everyday life to this level of even being able to rejoice in hardship? So let me ask the question, why can we rejoice in hardship? And the Bible gives reasons to rejoice. Now, I want you to think about this carefully. We're going to go through the reasons, but does anybody just want to take a stab at, at answering the, 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 the question? Yeah. Why? What are the reasons to rejoice? Why can we rejoice? The Bible gives specific reasons why we can rejoice in hardship. Can anybody think of one? If somebody comes and asks you, well, why should a Christian rejoice? In heart. What? Because of what? Because of the Lord. Okay. And that is the first thing that, that Paul says in um, in Philippians. Let me see which verse is it. Um, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I will say rejoice. So when, when he says rejoice in the Lord... He's saying that your reason for rejoicing is the fact that you are in the Lord. Okay, so that's the very first reason that you can rejoice because you're in the Lord. There's another way that Jesus f frames the same thing. Um, do you remember? Uh, let me give you the passage and you can look it up. It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Somebody want to read that for us? The disciples go out. And they have this power evangelism time. And they come back and they say, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. And Jesus, rather than saying, go God. And uh, he says something else. In Luke chapter 10, uh, it's either verse 20 or verse 27. My handwriting's bad. I think it could be 27. <laughs> My handwriting is bad. Okay. What did I write? Here we go. Luke Love God with your heart. Luke Wait a minute. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's verse 20. So they come back and they say, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And then what does Jesus say, verse 20? Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are sub subject to you. But rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You see, we don't rejoice in what God does through us. We rejoice in what God has done for us. Okay, I, hold on. Do you see? And this is a big misconception today in Christianity. Everybody, everybody wants to talk about what God does through them. You know, look at all the things God did through my ministry and 
you know, God did this, God did that. Well, um, that's not really the issue. The issue is not what God did through us. The issue is what God has done for us in Christ, and he's written our names in the book of heaven. And that's the number one reason why it is that we can rejoice no matter what's going on. Because you know what? If the worst thing possibly happens, which is you die, who cares? Yeah. You know? Exactly. Paul says, uh, I'm thinking about this, and I don't know whether I should depart and be with the Lord, or should I stay on for the sake of your faith? He says this to the Philippians in chapter 1, and then he says, well, I think I'll stay on for the sake of your faith, you know, and I'm pretty con convinced of that. But he said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and this is far better. So for, from the Christian perspective, death was not a big deal. In fact, death was a graduation. So this is another thing. The joy of the Lord and understanding that our names are written in the book of heaven does change the way we deal with hardship. It doesn't overwhelm us. So many people's Christianity is nothing more than idolatry. Oh, God, heal me. God, heal me. Well, what if God doesn't want to heal you? What if he doesn't answer your, 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 your prayers? Well, guess what? Yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's what Job said. Because true faith is believing that God is God. He can do whatever he wants to. And true faith is we live in a world of sin and death and evil. And sometimes bad things happen to God's people. And that's just the way it is. We don't live in a just world. We don't live in a world where if I do good, good's going to come to me. Psalm 73 tells us we do not live in a just world. And it really bugged the psalmist in Psalm 73. It, it, if, if you ever want a psalm to read and memorize... Read and memorize Psalm 73 if you're struggling with, you know, this world is not fair and I can't believe this happened to me because I was trying to be so good in front of the Lord and good for the Lord. Read Psalm 73. You will see that we do not live in a just world. We live in an unjust world where the bodies of the evil ones are stronger and they've eaten more. So the scripture says their bodies are fat. They're not plagued as other men are. They don't get sick. You know, often non-Christians have more money, they're healthier, and everything seems to go well. And then you got the Christians over here, and wow, everything bad seems to be ha happening to them. Well, other religions will say, well, that was karma from a past life. Uh, other religions will say, well, you must have done something bad to deserve it. Christianity says we live in a world that's unjust full of sin and evil and death. And you worship the God who's overcome death for you so that when you face it, you don't have to have fear. Instead, you can have joy. So you, you see how this is completely different from, from uh, uh, other religions? Christian spirituality is distinctive, and joy is one of the biggest distinctive markers of that joy. So what have we seen? Number one that we can rejoice because we're in the Lord. Number two, and related to that, we can rejoice in hardship because our names are written in, in, in the book of life in heaven. Now there's some more reasons. Look at James chapter 1, verse 2. Can someone read that for us? James 1, verse 2. Reasons to rejoice. James chapter 1, verse 2. This is a great passage to memorize if you haven't memorized it. Who wants to read it? James 1, 2. My brethren and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials. And then he goes on. Yes. Read, read the next verse. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Mm -hmm. And that endurance has its perfect effect so that you will be perfect and complete and not... Deficient. Deficient in anything. Okay. So consider it all joy. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter what? Good days? Mm -hmm. A new phone? Trials and many kinds. Consider it all joy when you, cons when you experience trials. Why? Because why? You know that the testing of your faith produce perseverance or endurance. Right. Exactly. 
God is doing something good in you through the hardship. He's growing you up. Immature Christians want every day to be a good day where everything goes their way. Mature Christians want God to change them so that no matter what happens, they can rejoice in him. And that's the difference between spiritual immaturity, which characterizes a lot of Christianity. And I don't, I don't usually ever criticize the charismatic movement because I just don't like it when people um, start doing that. The charismatic movement has many strong points in it. That they have amazingly joyful worship. They have um, a joyful expectation of the presence of God when they gather together. There's many wonderful things about charismatic Christianity, but my experience of working with so many charismatics in China uh, over the years has caused me to not like charismatic theology in, in one specific area. It has to do with healing because they're immature. They, they think that it's maturity to believe that in Christ Jesus there's, there's the power to heal. I believe that, that, that there's power to heal. But then if Jesus chooses not to heal, then I have had professing Christians look at me in the face and say, this is why I left Christianity. I prayed for my mom and she didn't get healed. I had this illness and, and I didn't get healed. So it's, it's idolatry. It's going to the temple, paying your money, saying your, the magic words. And then if your God doesn't answer, you go off to a different God because that first God didn't hear you. Well, people want to manipulate God and make him do what they want. That's not prayer. Prayer is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I don't always know what God's will is. So I'm not going to tell God what he has to do. God, you have to heal me. No, you don't have to heal me. You can take me home to be with you. You can do whatever you want to with me because I'm yours. That's maturity. So joy is the marker of whether or not we have Christian maturity. Joy and hardship. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And endurance is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's what causes you to win the race. Without endurance, people like flop out. One of the greatest compliments anyone ever paid me was on the day where I defended my PhD dissertation um, at the University of Hawaii. So for my final oral examination where, where um, I present my whole dissertation, my thesis, what I learned and everything, uh, the, de the head of the political science department of the University of Hawaii, in addition to all my professors, the head of the department came to my dissertation defense. And I'd never really talked to him um, before, but he said, he said to me something on the way out. He said, I really admire you. And he said, you endured. Because during the time of studying for my PhD, I had six retinal detachments and, and reattachments, six. And I lost my vision. I had to go through uh, surgeries and then re rehab and everything, and um, it, it was terrible. And then I had to deal with the Chinese secret police following me around the world, Seriously? doing awful things to me and my family. Um, I, I, I really went through some, some difficulty in order to write my um, dissertation on the political response of China's house church Christians to persecution. So I researched something that was considered by the government of the People's Republic of China to be a state secret. I wasn't supposed to be re researching that question, but they were very interested in, in what I discovered, interested enough to send a Communist Party official to my um, dissertation defense, and then he asked to interview me after it so I could tell the Chinese government what I learned about which groups would become violent, which religious groups had the capacity and the will to become violent to revolt against the government. So I, I spent 10 minutes talking to the man and, and, and answering all of his questions about um, uh, that the, the government wanted to know. And then 
one year later when I applied for a visa to go back into mainland China, because I, I hadn't gone into China for three years. So when I applied to get my visa, they gave me a 10-year multiple entry visa, mm -hmm. and they halved the visa fee. Mm -hmm. So when, when, my, yeah. when my travel agent in Jakarta, uh, at Bimatama Tours and Travel, got my passport back, she, she freaked. She called me on the telephone. She's been a travel agent for 30 years. She said, I've never seen this before. So she, she wrote on a post-it note, which I have and I can show you on my um, Google Photos. She wrote on, on my um, passport, I've never seen this happen in all my years of being a travel agent. So uh, it was hard and it was difficult and I wanted to bag out. I asked for seven extensions. Which, which was terrible because, you know, they were, they were supposed to grant me one and I asked for six more. And I had a good reason I lost my eyesight, you know, so every time I had a, a good reason and every time they're like, we want you to finish, we want you to finish. But, but the man came up to me, who was the head of our department, a really kind man, and he, said to, and he said to me, you endured. He said, anybody else would have dropped out of the program. And I endured. And so when I look at my dissertation and see that I've left the church a resource for understanding how the Chinese church got to where they are today and what issues they face and what their mindset is, I've left the church a very valuable resource. But that happened because God worked in me endurance where I said, I'm not going to drop out no matter what. I'm going to keep on going. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was finish that dissertation. And on the day I finished it, I, I've never experienced so much happiness. I wouldn't say it was joy. I'll say it was just happiness. It's done. It's over with. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's, and now I get happy whenever I, it, at the end of the month, get Amazon.com sends me the record of how many people bought it. And then I get even happier. Um, but <laughs> <clears throat> my point is, is that it was hard. Trials are hard. Enduring in the midst of hardship in our lives is hard. And yet, in the middle of all that, God says, have joy. Because this endurance I'm working in you is for your own good. So we praise the Lord because we are in him. We praise the Lord because our names are recorded in the book of life. And we praise the Lord for what it is that he's working in us as we endure and and grow up in him. So these are things that I've, I've, ex I've learned from the scriptures. I can't say I've mastered it. Um, sometimes I complain, sometimes I curse. Um, sometimes it doesn't look like I'm joyful at all. Um, and I'm still learning, still learning. But this is what I say to myself Christianity is.